All right. So what we're going to do is uh, talk about the, the topics that Artie pointed out. And uh, what we'll do, I think we just need the thank you, the pointer, and the advancer. And uh, just showing our financial disclosures. And then Alvin's. And Alvin, I'm going to let you take this off, starting with, uh, I think, one of Jack's favorite topics. Yes. And again, what we do, since we have a lot of time, many of you know me, I talk pretty fast, so we're going to slow it down, give some time for some interaction, uh, throw your hands up, yell at us if you have questions or comments. And um, even though Artie didn't give us this topic, this is one I get asked all the time, uh, and it's about vitamin D. And, and a couple of things that came out, I want you to kind of look at this very closely. So last year, this is an article that came out of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And they looked through that database and they said, of patients who are on vitamin D, they saw a couple of things. They saw there was an increased mortality in patients who had a level less than 20. And again, most labs, you look at these numbers, like in my lab, it's between 30 and 80 nanograms per ml. And then when they tease out the patients, the Caucasian patients, which is the white line here, versus other races, they definitely saw that trend mainly in these Caucasian patients that indeed to decrease their mortality, you need to have a level of 30, 40, or 50 nanograms per ml. So I tell people the take home message here, if you're gonna treat them, you know, definitely wanna treat them and monitor these levels aggressively. I was doing this, I told my PA, Amanda, who's here at the meeting, I said, this is what the new paradigm is gonna be moving forward, until last month, this article came out of New England Journal. So they had a pretty decent database of 26,000 patients, 5,000 black patients, and they were randomized to get vitamin D, omega-3 or placebo. And they were to follow for a period of time and their primary endpoint said, hey, let's look for major cardiovascular events, um, MICVA, a cardiovascular disease for all causes, and in invasive cancer. They were followed for a mean of 5.3 years, and the take-home message, they saw no difference. So if you look at the previous slide, okay, said so maybe yes, that maybe in the Caucasian patients, a higher dose is going to be better for them. But indeed, when you look at this new data and you know, a decent number of patients, that it might not make a difference. So, Arn, what are you telling your patients now about vitamin D? So it's a big deal, I think, uh, for, I still feel that uh, sufficient vitamin D is important for mineralization of new bone. It's also important to absorb calcium through the intestinal wall. Aside from that, I'm getting conflicting uh, reports and also uh, advice from especially my cardiology colleagues that are suggesting that it be, as you said, Alvin, in the 40 to 50 range uh, without, I think, sufficient data to, to support that. We're, this is still up in the air as far as I'm concerned. It's, uh, it's conflicting. And as you just pointed out, there's some that looks uh, like it's important to have enough vitamin D and others it says it's not important. One word of caution. So my doctor did my vitamin D level last year, and it was, uh, the level was denied by the insurance company. So I had to pay $267 out of pocket. So I was mad. <laughs> so I don't know if it costs of being a, an African-American male, but I think in some patients it may or may not be covered. So keep that in mind. The test is not that inexpensive. Um, all right, now let's talk about a little bit more about osteoarthritis. And a couple of pearls that are coming out, so if you, like me, you have the fellows, you have the residents, I have PA students that work through the clinic, you know, what are you teaching them about patients and whether you're looking at the disease? I said, just by shaking a patient's hand, you can almost say, you know, you're like Sherlock Holmes. You look at the hand, you ask them, hey, are you having any knee pain? Because now we know that if you have those Hebridans and Bouchard's nodules, that there's a higher chance that you will have progressive osteoarthritis of the knees. And this is some studies I looked at, and I'll actually build to the next slide, because it shows you that if you look at the first digit, and we all see those patients coming in, uh, they want to have injections, they have lots of pain, they have subluxation of that first M MCP joint, and then they actually say, looking at the knees, they go on within eight years to progress to get osteoarthritis. Why is this critical? So now knowing these data, okay, now you can take that 35-year-old, 40-year-old lady who has those nodules, she's afraid she's gonna end up like her mother, and that's the time to intervene. So doing the Tai Chi, doing the quad straps, uh, quad strap strength, quad strap, quadriceps strengthening exercises, all those kind of things is something to kind of think along those lines. If that doesn't help, then we kind of progress out therapy and I say maybe let's give them something that may be a more anti-inflammatory agent. And here's my, I'll give you my take home message here guys, stop using hydroxychloroquine. Because when you look at the studies, and we all anecdotal, I used it, I was taught in my fellowship at Duke, you'll give the hydroxychloroquine for these patients, and it does not work. Now, anecdotally, some of you are gonna come up to the mic, yes, I have patients, and I do too as well. But if you take 200 patients that are followed for a period of time, and they are looked at for, um, I said it was 16, 24 weeks, six months, and you saw there was no difference, looking at their pain, looking at their function, you're saying nothing at all. 
This is a study out of Europe, so they had paracetamol, which is Tylenol, as their treatment. Uh, no NSAIDs or steroids were allowed. And indeed, if you look at the guidelines for the ACR, it says, okay, using topical medications first, NSAIDs, using Tylenol, acetaminophen first, and really, really reserving the NSAIDs, really, really avoiding the opiates and things like Ultram uh, before putting them on, their, on the drugs. Now, if you live in Texas, you might say, okay, I'm not going to use hydroxychloroquine. I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to give a TNF agent for those patients. Uh, and not to call anybody's name, Roy. But if you look at these patients, um, here's a study. Again, 90 patients treated with the Tanacept for six months. They were given 50 milligrams once a week and then given 25 milligrams once a week compared to placebo. And not only did they look at function and look at all the clinical parameters, they actually did some imaging. Paul Emery talked to us about ultrasound. I'm glad to hear this. He said everybody should be doing that. They did ultrasounds and MRI on these patients. And if you look at the pain, you look at the function, there was essentially absolutely no difference in patients treated with etanercept. They did see the subgroup analysis that when you look at those patients, that you do see some changes. They see some bone marrow lesions. And of course, we know with the TNF antagonist that you can actually improve those areas. And you can see some difference there as well. You even saw some improvement in the grayscale on the ultrasound as well. So Orange, just like the vitamin D, so what are you telling your patient about OA? So this is a difficult situation because we <laughs> want to help people. We know from the, the statistics in the United States, there's about 31 million people that have osteoarthritis. And quite frankly, we have over, what, 12 uh, effective products for rheumatoid arthritis, for psoriatic arthritis, and for something that's much more prevalent. We have really nothing. Nonetheless, as you, as you pointed out, Alvin, that uh, etanercept TNF inhibition may have some effect on the subchondral bone, but as you'll get to later with the new guidelines, the FDA uh, recommendations for what is an effective disease-modifying anti-osteoarthritic drug, not only do you have to have effect on structural, but you have to have effect on, uh, on clinical. And we'll talk about that as well. And I struggle with these patients because, again, these are patients you see all the time in the clinic. You say, what do you use? And then we not only talk about the efficacy, but we talk about the cost. I think Paul Emery alluded to the cost, I say, for a TNF agent in Europe. I was in Stockholm last week, and Lars Klarsko told me the same thing, that uh, adalimumab there is $2,700 per year. So it's a difference in using these agents in the U.S. And even hydroxychloroquine, the cost has gone up. And to end up on OA, I thought we'd do so another thing. So this is another systemic uh, review that came out in a meta-analysis. And I want to look at all the different ages. This just almost reminds me of other drugs or diseases we looked at. Every single drug has been studied to look at for a patient with osteoarthritis of the knee. And I'm going to go to the forward slide, and I'll come back to the conclusion here. But if you look at this forest plot, there's only a couple of things that maybe suggest that it definitely works. Now, we talked about a couple of years ago at the meeting that using uh, intraarticular steroids, you really don't see a, a big difference. Uh, that maybe beta-methasone might give you a little suggestion of a hint of some improvement in some patients. The caveat is what is going to be your outcome? How long do you monitor those patients? Is 12 weeks enough? Do you need to monitor them for six months or even a year? And then, as we'll get to in a minute, do we want to look at them for structural type changes? So what do you do? And at the very end of this, this is a molecule called spiferman that's actually in the development for osteoarthritis. And this is a molecule that induces cost, um, osteo, uh, excuse me, chondrocyte formation. So maybe looking at your build new cartilage cells. But if we go back aside, the take home message from this review, that all these things have been studied over the years and looking for 12 months of follow-up, there's a really uncertainty around what you use. Do I use intraarticular steroids? Yes, some people swear by them. I have some patients with severe disease that we use them uh, more frequently every two or three months to get them under control. Now if we move fast forward, then what about other things? And this is uh, something too to kind of talk about is using cannabis. I think Ann Stevens alluded to this yesterday. Um, at ACR last year, I debated um, Dwayne Peterson uh, about the use of um, you know, uh, uh, medical marijuana for all diseases. And there's a little hint of stuff coming from the preclinical stages. So if you look at patients with osteoarthritis, uh, Ann alluded to that the CB1, for the most part, is on the, on the, on the nerve cells. It's on the brain, CNF, oligocyte, uh, um, uh, things in the brain. But if you look at the CB2, you find those on other immune cells, but you also find them on the synovia and on the chondrocytes. And what does that mean? So when you look at this, you know about the cannabinoid system. We have our endocannabinoids. So when Artie's running on the treadmill in the morning, that's why he gets this kind of internal high. I mean, all those kind of things we see from that. And here's we learn a lot from these drugs, because if you take a knockout model, get rid of the CB2 receptors, those mice in certain models, they get severe osteoarthritis compared to the wild type. So that's what's seen in the, in the animal models. But when you translate that to patients, put patients on naproxen, and naproxen was superior into a molecule that inhibited the degradation of these endocannabinoids. 
So do we have the right molecule yet? Uh, do we have the right mechanism of action? We don't know yet. And then when you look at this particular agent, they didn't see any of the cannabinoid-type adverse events. So the nausea, the polyphagia, meaning getting the munchies and all those kind of things that you see from these patients. But this is something to be studied. And one of the reasons we bring this up, because as you look at the map of the U.S., the uh, marijuana, uh, particularly the recreational, has been approved. I need to update the slide because uh, Michigan uh, just went dark green. It just became legal now. In 11 different states, you can go recreational. And I heard on the news Monday and while I was in L.A. about you can have your marijuana now delivered by Uber uh, to your house. It's just no joke. Or Lyft. Or you know, Lyft, right? You can get it up and get it developed. How many people every single day to ask you this in the clinic? What about medical marijuana or CBD? Please. And in, in my experience, it's not the 20 or the 30-year-old patient. These are people 60, 70, 80 years old. They want to get better. They want to do something more natural. And this is why. So keep your eyes on this, uh, and we're going to see more and more coming along. Arnie alluded to this, and we're going to come back to this. So what about what's the final end point when we think about osteophytes? that indeed we're still struggling to find a disease-modifying drug like we have for RA and PSA and all of our other diseases. And what the FDA has put some guidance on, so yes, and now the structural endpoints are good, that you want to see the structural changes, but that has to be related to some reliable clinical outcomes. And the two things he's identified, so decrease in total joint replacements, but also a reduction of pain and worsening of the function. So you've got to have both of those to kind of meet these criteria. And this was a little surprise to us when we saw the data come out of ACR last year. You're seeing, hearing a lot about the Cantos trial, and here's some more data looking at those same group of patients with osteoarthritis. That indeed, you take 10,000 patients with a history of MI, and some of which had a high sensitive CRP, and then you do this post hoc exploratory analysis in patients who had osteoarthritis. And they had significant amounts that had osteoarthritis in severe, what's called osteoarthropathy. And again, that was just based on what the investigators had um, you know, searched them to be. So when you put down and did two different, all the different doses of this IL-1, uh, uh, you can see um, that all the different ones were better than placebo. Uh, and again, so decrease in total joint replacements and also osteoarthritis-related um, adverse events. And here you can see the uh, Kaplan-Meier kind of plots as well. So I mean, you hear more and more about this as so using an IL-1 inhibitor what will that do for a patient with osteoarthritis? And again, is meeting some of the outcomes. Um, Orin, what do you think about this? This is going to be a cost issue. It looks interesting. I think uh, this, this, there's efficacy here. But uh, the cost of, of this IL-1 beta receptor blocker is going to be uh, significant for such a huge pro problem. But if it does decrease uh, joint replacements, that may factor into its, uh, into its use. I think the caveat here is going to be which group of patients, of course, the orthopedic surgeons are not going to go out of business with the use of this drug. But I think what you will see, some, there are some patients who are not candidates for knee replacements, particularly younger patients who might have more aggressive disease. And they kind of finally end up on osteoarthritis. You hear more and more about this nerve cell um, growth factor uh, um, blockage with this uh, uh, tenezumab. Uh, being CNTs are some of the, the scientific stuff coming out with this, and there's some data that came out of ACR that in this phase three trial, if you take patients, these are kind of difficult group of patients that fail almost all the things we use, not only acetaminophen, NSAIDs, but also tramadol and, and opiates, or wouldn't take the opiates. And they were randomized and given two different doses, a 2.5 milligram dose, and then a higher dose. They started at 2.5 and went to five milligrams. And what you saw compared to placebo, a decrease in pain, uh, an improvement in their function, and overall patient global assessment, all that got better as well. So it checked off all the boxes that the FDA is looking for. The only caveat is that there were a small group of patients who had progression of the osteoarthritis, that indeed the osteoarthritis worsened. And then also patients developed some paresthesia, and that's one of the side effects that we could expect by blocking this nerve cell growth factor. And in some patients, um, that is, it may not be reversible. So again, this is a drug that looks like it might work, um, but we're going to talk about not only the monetary costs, but also what are the costs uh, to patients. And to kind of finally end up on osteoarthritis, we're looking for uh, some guidance, not only from the ACR, but from our, 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 our European colleagues as well. And one of the things I like about what Joseph Smallin and all of his group that usually does, you know, you really give us some data that says it's really based on the evidence. That when you look at these guidelines and you're using these, that you really can be assured this is based on the evidence. For example, I'm looking at the one that says number, um, uh, yes, yeah, so look at number eight. That says good le uh, level of evidence to say, hey, you should not be using the biologic drugs uh, for patient patient with osteoarthritis. Uh, chondroitin sulfate. I mean, I reviewed the data a few years ago saying that chondroitin sulfate, even in Europe, where it's given at prescription doses, it doesn't really work. 
So again, we have some guidance now from our colleagues, and I think this is going to be help, up, help out. So I'm going to pick it up from here and talk about gout and uh, look at some of the ways that we have, we make the diagnosis and looking at the diagnostic advances in synovial fluid analysis. And so the, the classic um, gold standard, of course, is looking compensated polarized light microscopy. If I could just get a show of hands for all of those who did training in rheumatology, how many had to look for gout crystals under a polarizing microscope? Everybody. So there we go. <laughs> so that's been for the past 50 years. What do we do next? because you know that that's very time consuming and not always as accurate as we'd like to think. There's this one study, as you see, 110 participants, rheumatologists, lab techs, rheumatology trainees, other physicians that were interested in crystal arthritis completed an online test interpreting these compensated polarizing light microscopy images. The goal was to identify 30 images from pathognomonic slides that contained different crystals or artifacts. The primary outcome was the correct identification of all eight monosodium urate and all eight clinically important non-monosodium urate images, and that was achieved by just under 40%. However, the correct identification of the monosodium urate images, 81%, CPP, D crystals, only 68%. So how else can we identify uh, these crystals to make it more accurate? Well, we know that, and we've, Alvin and I have both talked about uh, imaging techniques over the past few years here at this conference, ultrasound and DECT, dual energy CAT scan, which are highly specific for crystal deposition, but the sensitivity really is dependent on the duration and disease burden. For example, if you have early gout, then DEX scanning isn't quite as sensitive. And similarly, if you have tophaceous gout, DEX is much more sensitive than non-tophaceous gout. But there are other novel methods for crystal detection that are being developed, and I'm just gonna share a couple of those with you. So this is not for those that like noodles. This is <laughs> RA. M-A-N, not E-N, spectroscopy. So this measures the sample chemical composition of the, of the sample, which makes it 100% specific. So if you just look over to the right, you have, and we know that each material has inherent um, absorption and light scatter when exposed to energy, and it produces a, a unique signature, or what's called a Raman spectrum. So the protocol, the first three here, a, B, and C is that you uh, digest the sample, you dilute it, you put it into a syringe microfilter, and then through this um, box uh, um, evaluator, the synovial microfiltrate is put in, and you have this point of care Raman spectroscopy looking for the exact identification of monosodium urate or calcium pyrophosphate crystals. But the, the point here is, and, and one of the caveats, is that it cannot detect whether or not these crystals are intra or extracellular. And again, the definitive diagnosis of one of the crystal deposition diseases is intracellular um, ingestion of the crystals, and you can't tell that. So this Raman spectroscopy shouldn't replace, but potentially be used in conjunction with compensated polarizing light microscopy. This is another technique called lens-free microscopy, and this lens-free platform, it looks a little complicated, but there's, there's a, a transparent body fluid sample above this complementary um, circular uh, image sensor, and then you have this uh, microscopic uh, slide here, and you have your crystals, and it goes through the different compensations here, but what ends up happening when you look at this lens-free microscopy, you have a full field of view here on the left in this lens-free hologram, and then they broke it down into three regions of interest, as you see going across here. The lens-free differential, the lens-free pseudocolor versus compensated like microscopy, and you see that there's a lot more crystals in this middle than you can see on the right. So again, another potential way to look at and look for uh, crystal deposition in synovial fluid. Or can I ask a question before sure. you move on? I tap an MTP sometime, even on ultrasound guidance, I might get a drop or two of fluid out. How much do I need to do either one of these techniques? Do I need a, you know, several cc's? No, you don't. So it's actually this, uh, this pointed out, there was a 0.1 and um, uh, one micromillimeter, uh, wow. respectively, looking at that fluid. So, so not a lot. You don't need a lot for that. Uh, I haven't utilized this tech, these techniques, but uh, looks of interest. 
And then back to dual energy CT. And just uh, for those that aren't as familiar, this, there's two different energies, 80 or 100 kilovolt and 140 kilovolt that are directed at orthogonal angles to each other to gather attenuation profiles for targets with varying densities versus a conventional CAT scan that has sing a single energy source. They have post-processing um, software that differentiates this low urate deposition from other denser materials. The urate is in green, the calcium in uh, purple here, and very good se uh, sensitivity and specificity. As you see, the number is 78 to 100% sensitive, 76 to 93% uh, specific when compared to uh, compensated polarizing light microscopy in synovial fluid. And I mentioned that if it's a a recent onset of gout, it's not quite as sensitive, and in non-tophaceous gout, not quite as sensitive. But of interest here are novel areas for de detection of urate. When you have patients that have gout that have costal pain, that have disc pain, sacral iliac joint pain, and carna in particular, coronary and aortic vasculature, and so this is, may be a new target, and we'll talk just a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about um, the importance of hyperuricemia, gout, and its importance in cardiovascular disease. The limitation here is that these scanners are not widely available. And if I can, again, just get a show of hands. How many people have access to a DEC scan? Wow. So it's about it. Less than half. So um, a very useful technique, especially if you have patients that just either won't let you get near them with a needle uh, or you're looking, you don't have access to, uh, to ultrasound. Um, so now, Orrin, this makes me nervous. I have three ultrasound machines. I got to get rid of my machines now and go to this? Uh, or do I do it in people only who have high risk factors? I mean, where do I use this? I haven't ordered one. I just... Alvin, you started this morning saying that you were going to talk slowly and the thing. And it wasn't until just now yeah, I know. that things kind of slowed down. <laughs> Don't be afraid, Alvin. Okay. There's, ah, okay. there's evidence here that <laughs> ultrasound is very useful. This is a, a, a study from Norway looking at uh, how ultrasound shows rapid reduction of uric acid load during a treat-to-target approach in gout. And this longitudinal study looked at monthly follow-up until the target was met, 161 patients with crystal proven gout and a recent flare with uh, serum uric acid over six. And you can see as you go across here, <clears throat> the treating to target and then um, both in the femoral condyle, this, the arrows here, and in the metacarpal phalangeal joint, uh, the double contour sign. So let me tell you, because this is how we use the ultrasound. So if I have a patient who has had a gout flare, Okay, I don't commit them to therapy. We bring them back, we treat the acute flare, and then with the ultrasound, I'm screening the contralateral MTP, I'm looking at their knees. And if I see uric acid, then the cat's already out of the back, they go on therapy. But if they only had one flare, I resolve that flare, and they have no systemic changes. Hmm. So that's been kind of my approach. I'll be curious to hear what other people are saying. Over on the right. And so the Cantos trial shows up again. So there was uh, Artie and Jack talking about this, and Peters, Alvin mentioned it, but there's a lot of secondary analyses from this uh, group of patients that are important. They've had a coronary event, and they have uh, persistent elevated CRP. So one of the secondary analyses was the serum uric acid and the incidence rate for gout and cardiovascular events. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the, the beauty here is that the study has over 10,000 patients uh, with stable atherosclerosis, prior MI, uh, and they were randomized to either getting placebo, canakinumab, 50, 150, or 300 milligrams every three months sub-Q. And so the rates in placebo for gout and major adverse events increase across baseline serum uric acid uh, strata. And so the importance here is you see that uh, on the right in the table, uh, the, the events of gout risk by treatment assignment and baseline serum uric acid on the right. The importance is, as I mentioned earlier, when finding a monosodium urate deposition in the coronary vasculature, that these patients are at increased risk for a heart attack and death if they have gout. Um, interestingly, we have in the United States, we don't have an indication to treat asymptomatic hyperuricemia. They do in Japan. And so they know that there's an increased risk of hypertension, of chronic kidney disease, of uh, cardiovascular events, but because there's so many patients, depending on what you consider hyperuricemia and what the different lab values uh, 
report out, that that would mean almost everyone gets treated for hyperuricemia. So um, it's just something to keep in the back of our minds. We know that serum uric acid is a risk marker for both gout and cardiovascular events. And again, IL-1 beta inhibition effectively pre prevents these conditions, and you, as you see here, even without having an effect on serum uric acid level. <clears throat> So this is a little bit of a busy slide, but there's implications of the new CARES trial that was an FDA-mandated trial because of the cardiovascular events that, uh, that appeared in the Febusostat studies. So this is the FDA public alert on Febusostat safety for clinical practice, and it was a non-inferiority study comparing Febusostat with allopurinol over six, almost 6,200 patients with gout and, a major cardio, and major cardiovascular disease with a mean follow-up of 32 months. There was no difference in the occurrence of the primary endpoint composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or unstable angina with urgent revascularization, but car uh, cardiac death was significantly more common in the Febusostat, 4.3, versus allopurinol, 3.2%. So there are strengths on the left side of the study and then uncertainties that arose from the study. The strengths, again, nice, large, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled study of the relevant population with gout and established coronary vascular disease or cardiac disease, and it was powered for cardiovascular events, a state-of-the-art adjudication process for relevant cardiovascular endpoints, and a direct comparison of allopurinol even with doses above 300 milligrams uh, to effective doses of allopurinol compared to febuzostat. And coltracine was used as an initial flare prophylaxis as opposed to non anti-inflammatory agents. So, Arne, this is like the vitamin D story. So what's the take-home message here? I mean, I got one data saying it's good, one data saying it's bad. What do we do? Like, she's talking about a young patient here. Does she put her on one of these drugs, or does she just kind of watch and see? Well, because of this, there were implications for our clinical practice. And on the left, we have informative discussions with patients. We're allowed to now and should have these informative discussions on febusostat cardiovascular mortality risk when initiating and maintaining the drug and this important shared decision making. But it doesn't support febusostat as a first line drug for urate lowering therapy. And it raises these new questions that you just brought up, Al. Mm -hmm. So if you look on the right, and I won't go through the, the whole algorithm, you either have no history of allopurinol intolerance, an Asian without the HLA um, uh, B5801 gene, and you either use allopurinol successfully, or you go down to a serum uric acid with either history of renal stone going over to Febusostat, or cardiac disease going over to allopurinol. The bottom algorithm looks at a history of allopurinol intolerance or an Asian population that has the gene, and then renal stone versus cardiac disease. So there are clinical guidelines here. So of interest now, coming out of our, our clinics and back into the lab, this is a novel recombinant oral urate oxidase, so urox, ALNN 346, reducing severe hyperuricemia and normalizing hyperuricosuria in nephropathic urox knockout mice. And without getting into great detail here, there's only a couple of ways that uh, we're actually able to get rid of urate that uh, we commonly use, which is either inhibiting xanthine oxidase or trying to get it through the, um, the kidneys with the uricosuric drug. But this uh, is recognizing the increased role of uh, the GI tract in urate homeostasis, especially in, in at least these uh, mice, uh, chronic kidney disease models. And so this is a novel technique of mm -hmm. targeting uh, uric acid uh, and lowering serum urate and normalizing urinary uric acid in nephropathic um, knockout mice and with an enhanced elimination of urate via the GI tract. It may add to urate lowering therapy when it comes to uh, human trials. So this is a particularly interesting um, um, poster, and actually it was a proof of concept case uh, series. I know that John Botson's here in the audience with us. Again, thank you, John, for coming back. But I thought this was particularly interesting because of the, uh, the utility of case in our patients that have tophasis gout and having a whole other mechanism of action to really uh, get much better control of these patients, and they don't have to be severe patients with uh, tophaceous nodules all over them, uh, just really uncontrolled refractory uh, gout uh, that uh, are not responsive to urate-lowering or uricosuric drugs. Um, 
the, the great part about this is that at least in the studies, there was about 42%, as you see on the right, um, uh, efficacy here in um, uh, full responders, uh, which left the other part of that as uh, inadequate responders, but they still responded, uh, especially during the first seven to eight weeks. Uh, and then um, if patients, if you follow the guidelines, or what they, the company calls the stopping rules, of at least two consecutive, uh, sometimes people are doing one, but I go to two consecutive uh, serum uric acid levels over sex, then you stop the drug because the patient likely has developed uh, drug antibodies. So what do we do when patients are d developing drug antibodies, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis with the anti-TNFs? We give them methotrexate, which is what exactly what John and uh, Jeff Peterson did in this uh, small proof of concept case series of nine refractory tophaceous gout patients started on case eight milligrams every two weeks per protocol. Uh, from three different separate infusion centers, they were given a month prior 15 milligrams of methotrexate with folic acid supplementation. There were 116 total peglodocase infusions. You see the numbers there. Um, as of October 1st, and John may comment on this if, uh, if you're in the room, John. Uh, as of October 1st, six had completed a full course of peglodocase. Three were ongoing. All the patients stayed on methotrexate with no dose adjustments. 100% responded with over 80% of serum uric acid levels maintained at the goal of less than six. So as you see here on the bottom right, the DEC scanning, which is another way that I utilize DEC, a pre and post uh, treatment to identify that I've gotten all of the, the monosodium urate uh, um, crystals out. And in addition, the infusion reactions in, the, uh, in those that had not gotten methotrexate, typical few percentage here where there was 0% in those that got methotrexate. So although this is not FDA approved, um, makes a lot of sense. And at least from my standpoint, uh, uh, this is something that I'm doing now for my patients starting peglodocase if there's no contraindications of using methotrexate. We've been doing this too. I mean, this really did change my practice. And after talking with John and talking to some of our colleagues at Horizon, uh, you know, I was using azathioprine and using methotrexate. I usually start at 15 milligrams, get their G6PD level that same day. The only challenge are, what do you do if somebody's got a creatinine elevation? So there are many of these patients at 1.3, 1 1.5. 1 I'm, I'm nervous about the methotrexate. You using azathioprine or steroids, or what would you do? I don't know if John would make comments about those patients as well. What would you do? So it depends on how high that, uh, that creatinine is, and yes, I'd monitor that, but um, at least in the beginning. If you can get these patients past a couple of months, which is the typical time period, that then they start to have an, that inadequate response, uh, loss of efficacy because of uh, drug antibody production. Uh, I'm not sure, if you watch them carefully, I'm not sure that I would change that. Maybe we should do a show of hands. People have been using peg loader case or using methotrexate. Are many people doing that now? A few. A small number. So this Anybody is new... using anything else? Azathioprine or anything else? Azathioprine? Jack does. Okay. So All just, right, some... just a few of us. So that's, that's of interest. Great. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, next, we're going to go to vasculitis. I think it was Eric that did an update for us last year or year before and kind of really giving us this nice, nice snap, snapshot of what vasculitis looks like. This is a review article from a, a and in 2013 talking about large, medium, and small vessel disease and gives you names. Uh, many of the fellows, you know, that the terminology has changed now, moving away from naming these diseases after people and giving specific uh, things. Um, I look at a number of different journals um, every month, and one of the ones that we'll look at is autoimmunity. And in the Journal of Autoimmunity earlier this year, some data came out looking at what we call a cluster analysis. And what this does looks at not only autoantibodies, which you see on the right side of the circle here, but also looks for the presence of uh, uh, cytokines themselves. So we know, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, we're going to see lots of a rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP. This almost reminds you of the kind of spider plots that uh, Vivica Strand has made very, very popular. But when you look on the left side, you'll say, hey, how many of these specific cytokine markers that you see in individual patients with rheumatoid arthritis? Why is this critical? Um, again, if you think about the snapshot, I think Artie alluded to this yesterday in this uh, study for the veterans, we know that cytokines and chemokines can drive the disease. And in this population of patients that you do see, of all those different cytokine markers you see, that those levels correlated with cancer. I'm saying this is a segue in as we get into things with vasculitis and thinking about other diseases. So they also looked at patients with lupus and with uh, systemic sclerosis and saw the same type of thing. On the right, you see the autoantibodies. We know with lupus, you get double-stranded DNA. You get the ANA antibodies as well. But I want you to look at some of the things that are coming up. Here's IL-1223. Here's some IL-8, a little bit of IL-6. 
So you're beginning to see some other markers that's beginning to play a role in these patients. And the same thing for systemic cirrhosis. Again, we know that all the antibodies are there, but look at what's coming up here now with some of these different cytokines. These are small numbers of patients, and the one cautious uh, I tell people, you're looking at cytokines, you gotta do, you know, pick the right time and the right you know, hour and things like that, look at patients, making sure there's no other disease that's going on, make sure a lady's not having a menses, because all those things can drive the cytokine levels. With that being said, though, this is a segue into some other viral diseases. So then indeed, when we look at IL-1223, what role it might be playing in vasculitis in something like giant cell arteritis. I put the little cartoon here on the left to show you what IL-1223 looks like. Remember the P40 subunit, which is uh, it's a common subunit between the two different cytokines. And indeed, now we have molecules that can antagonize that, that particular uh, molecule. But when you look at how these uh, cytokines work and what the signaling goes through, it goes through this JAK-STAT pathway. Keep your eyes on that. I'm going to come back to that later on. And then what they did in this study, took a group of patients and look, and indeed in those temporal artery biopsies, in those areas where you see the proliferation, you can see 1 plus, 2 plus, or 3 plus signaling staining for both IL-12 and 23. <clears throat> and here's something that's even more striking, that if you had patients whose biopsy was negative, you didn't see either one of the cytokines, but you only you found those at significant levels in patients who had both positive IL-12 and 23. So we know that we're using now, for example, this um, IL-6 blockers in these patients, but theoretically can we use something like uh, IL-1223 blocker, or can we indeed move forward into using other molecules that might even block the JAK-STAT pathway? And as many of you may or may not know, now there's a trinical trial that's going on looking at baricitinib in patients with relapse in giant cell arteritis. I throw it out to kind of tease you, and this is some things to keep your eyes on, I struggle with these patients just like all of you. We've learned over the years that the TNF drugs don't work, that methotrexate is not steroid sparing, that indeed the only drug that seems to work the best in these patients is going to be antagonizing IL-6. It is a challenge to get the drugs we have currently available, mainly because of the formulation. Um, most patients are over the age of 65, and you can't get the sub-Q formulation of our drug. Orrin, what do you think about these data? So I think you have some new targets. I think we need the clinical trials to prove that fact that they're going to be useful for us and then have access. So as you know, uh, for our GCA patients and getting uh, IL-6 inhibition for the patients in the age population, it's the IV drugs that we need for the Medicare population and hope or access to them from other ways. But there has to be the clinical trials to prove uh, not just the, the studies that show that these um, cytokines are, are in, the, in the arteries themselves. I think this is kind of exciting. It's something to keep your eyes on. So let's go into one area. And so many of you, I don't know if you've ever seen this. This is a, a, you know, not that common compared to some other things, but EGPA, eosinophilic uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Uh, we know if you look at the studies and look at the things that we know that the eosinophils play a role in this population of patients. That indeed, if you take, for example, asthma as a model for that, that again, the proliferation of those eosinophils, the degranulation of them, releasing all of these enzymes and markers that induce an inflammatory response that break down the, 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 the complement pathway as well. And that when you go into antagonizing and blocking the um, IL-5 receptor by using mepolizumab, that you can actually see some clinical response. So some data has come out when you're looking at the drug. This is given sub-Q. It's uh, 300 milligrams to subcutaneously once a month. I put the little study design up here. That if you take those patients who were actually on background steroids and on a stable dose of steroids, then in the group that was on mepolizumab, you saw a greater remission, okay? And again, you see that when you stop the drug, you see the, the waning off of that. And then if you look on the laps, you had less of the relapse on people on the mepolizumab group. For time's sake, I didn't put the other data in here, but they also looked at, can you do, use this as a steroid sparing agent? And again, UD could show that you allow people to reduce the cortical steroid use. So I think this is something kind of exciting. The caveat is another um, biologic drug and talk about some of the adverse events and safety. Or I don't know if, you, if anybody had a chance to use this. I have not used this one clinically yet. I haven't, I would, didn't participate in the studies. Okay, and it's uh, something to kind of think, to keep our eyes on when we're looking at these. Um, now we're going to move into vasculitis, and a couple of things we want to set the stage here for is thinking about where, where we are with our current treatments, what are the drugs, and then how can we begin to use some of the newer clinical trial information to help us in the clinic every single day. So now we talk about if we're getting patients with ankyl-positive vasculitis, and then we're looking at mycophenolate mofotil versus cyclophosphamide for induction of remission. You all know the protocol, high doses of steroids, IV cyclophosphamide for an induction regimen.
And he wants to say the same thing. If you can take those patients and put them on mycophenolate versus um, uh, uh, cyclophosphamide, you can see here that there is a little greater uh, reduction. And I look at the numbers here. So blue is the mycophenolate, and red is the cyclophosphamide. So you can see that it was non-inferior, and this is a non-inferiority trial, but what you did see, there was resulted in a higher relapse rate uh, compared to cyclophosphamide. The right-hand side of the slide is the most important for me. So if you have, what is the chance, okay, to stay away from the poison of cyclophosphamide if I want to use mycophenolate? What does the patient look like that I might be able to get them into remission uh, with this regimen? And you look over here, it's patients who have the PR3 positivity, older patients over the age of 60, and the ones who, uh, again, who did not have significant renal um, uh, abnormalities. So it again, it gives you a hint of it. And again, where I reserve the cyclophosphamide, working with my renal uh, physicians, uh, that is really almost my last resort, because using other agents along those lines. So something to think about. Now, once we got that patient to remission, what did we use to maintain the remission? And there's some newer data coming out that maybe is beginning to help us decide which patients and what drug can we put them on. So 115 patients, a positive anchor here, and they were in remission, uh, remission at the steroids and IV cyclophosphamide. And then here's what they do, a randomized rituximab, and I want you to look at, it's the lower dose. It's not the 1,000 milligram that we use for RA, the 500 milligram dose at the current regimen, and then go to every six months, compared to azathioprine, two mg per kilogram, and then slowly went down to one and a half. And if you look at the slides here, the azathioprine is in red, and you see the rituximab in the gray or the black here, you can see the numbers are greater. When you're looking at uh, reduction of remission um, and uh, reduction of flares uh, and decreasing of, of the other adverse events as well. On the right here, I'm looking at the slide here. Oh, yeah, they look at if uh, once we have a moderate or severe flare, so out of looking at five measures of kind of qualifying, uh, uh, quantifying the flares, you can see there's a big difference here. Again, when you look at this, there's no particularly adverse uh, reactions uh, that you see, so no more side effects of one drug versus the other. The next slide, I think, is even more important. So when you're using rituximab, do you give it on a scheduled basis or you give it more PRN? And again, so many of us doing this for our RA patients. So again, the same type of analogy, taking those patients, they are in remissions with IV uh, steroids and psychophosphamide, and then you say, hey, can you remain them um, into, uh, on, on, on rituximab and give it to you only when they flare or you do it on a fixed schedule? And again, the flare was based on looking at laboratory parameters and clinical parameters every three months and you really saw no difference. And this is a little different story than when we see with RA. We learned that RA, that the drug almost has to be given scheduled every four to six months. And this might say, hey, that maybe every three months, or can, when the patient really flaring based on labs and other symptoms, it might be something uh, that we could use. Um, and anything, Comments, anything that we can do to get away from using cyclophosphamide, <laughs> I think, is uh, welcome news. Michael Fenley, in, important uh, addition, it's looking like, and also rituximab. We're going to roll around. I'm just going to a couple other quick things to touch on. So, a Primalas and Bichette syndrome. Uh, you guys are seeing some data that came out. This is from ACR last year that showed, hey, yes, you can decrease these ulcers. And the drug does work really, really pretty quickly. Uh, you see within a few weeks these painful ulcers and everything as well. And then just to kind of summarize a new update uh, from our European colleagues is saying looking at where the recommendations are going to be for with Bichette syndrome. Uh, this is in ARD from last year. Uh, and I just want to highlight the one slide here, too, because it makes a difference in when we talk about the disease involvement. So unfortunately, some of these patients can get CNS involvement. They can get eye involvement as well. And they have some good level of evidence suggesting what drugs to use. And I put up here on the list because, again, in Europe, they still use drugs in some cases like thalidomide, where they don't have access to other drugs. Uh, so, um, and again, uh, Premalas is on the list and some others. So these guidelines can be very, very useful as you try to get your patient involved. Uh, I'm just going to zip through the other slides so I'm going to get Orrin some chance to get to his stuff. I'll put some other things in here. Uh, being in a part of the cold of the country where we see lots of a nose, what drugs do we use? Turns out maybe the PD-5 inhibitors might not work on as well. Uh, we put in the, in the handout, too, some information about using tocilizumab in people with Takayashus. So you see some information on that. Uh, and then we'll come back to maybe the question time, but what we're trying to tease you with, and we'll put all the data in there, is it time to say goodbye to cyclophosphamide? Do we have other drugs that might work just as well without all the safety? I give one dose of cyclophosphamide for the next 10 years. I'm looking at the urine. I'm worried about all of a sudden they're going to have some hematuria, and I'm worried about bladder cancer. And in the data we tease you with, with the IL-1223 antagonists, and then moving forward with the JAK inhibitors and PD-4 inhibitors, we got molecules now can not only block one cytokine, but a whole family of cytokines that might give us more clinical efficacy in some of the diseases that we currently struggle with. And that's going to be really telling.
And then what does 2019 hold? Like our colleague in the back say, we still need to know about the safety, and that's where we're going to get some other concerns here. So now we're going to kind of end up on scleroderma and lupus, aren't we? So the one slide I have for uh, scleroderma here is the FOCUS study. It's a phase three study, again, looking at tocilizumab, uh, 212 randomized uh, patients, one-to-one -one TCZ, 162 sub-Q weekly or placebo for a year. Uh, but it's, the study failed its primary endpoint. And this is really brought, uh, brought about by Ari Fisher, uh, also by Ann Peters looking at, and we, they talked about the CRIS criteria um, as to the primary endpoint, again, being the modified Rodman skin score, and it failed that uh, primary endpoint, but the, there was some um, lung function that was preserved in the tocilizumab group, uh, as you see on the right-hand side. Uh, there was a, a second study looking at abatacept and uh, systemic sclerosis, also failing its primary endpoint, uh, the modified Rodman skin score, but improving, improved in the secondary endpoints, again, the CRIS index and the change in HAC and improvement in the, and trending in the change in the FVC. So it was a lot of work still to be done for tocilizumab, uh, I'm sorry, for systemic sclerosis and for effective treatments that we need for this condition. I'm gonna uh, talk, I thought this was particularly exciting. This is something, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are seeing uh, uh, discoid lupus patients, but intradermal etanercept for remission induction in discoid LE, and this is a proof, proof of concept phase two study uh, that, that looked at these patients that were resistant to conventional therapies. TNF is pathogenic in discoid lupus, but systemic TNF inhibition induces these pathogenic uh, autoantibodies and disease flares. But if you give a low dose directly into the uh, skin lesion, there's sufficient neutralization of TNF in the lesion without systemic effects. So this is a prospective single arm phase two open label trial that was done in Leeds with only 25 patients. But as you uh, see, the, some of the patients that we uh, typically see at when I'm teaching at LA County at USC and had back in the days when uh, Dr. Du Bois was my mentor uh, in the early 80s, this was a particularly troubling problem uh, for patients that had the scarring uh, discoid lupus. Um, the primary endpoint was uh, greater than six patients achieving this modified limited score uh, activity and damage in discoid lupus, the m saddle uh, score, and secondary endpoints was physician and patient uh, global and uh, lesional thermography and laser Doppler imaging. Uh, the primary endpoint was met in 52% of the patients. And so uh, you have secondary endpoints here on, in the table, pre, post, and the uh, significant values with the uh, visual, uh, the physician and uh, patient globals. And uh, it looks like George wants to comment on this before I go on to the next slide. Yeah, Please this do. guy wants to comment. Um, Briefly, I could pretty much do the same thing with low-dose intralesional steroids uh, infiltrating the base every, you know, three to four weeks with two and a half milligrams of Kenalog in suspension um, and increase that dosing therapy based on response. The Tanercept's a bit more pricey than a vial of, of uh, Kenalog. Uh, and then the second thing, I just sort of want to rewind the tape a little bit about skin scores in scleroderma. Yes. I induce a lot of scars because I do a lot of surgery and procedures. I also manage you know, everything from morphia all the way up to systemic sclerosis. Remodeling scars with any kind of therapy requires a great deal of time and patience. And so when I look at skin endpoints, it's kind of like trying to soften, at least in, in scleroderma, it's kind of like trying to soften up a leather saddle. Um, you know, the, the movement is slow. It's tedious and it's time painstaking. And it's because we don't catch it early enough in the disease state. And we know there's that three or four month window where you can actually change that early violaceous, early morphia plaque, or even early evolving PSS, if you're lucky. You gotta catch that window. And if you don't, remodeling scar, because it is in essence avascular, you really cannot Im impact a change in any uh, immediate amount of time. And I don't think dermatologists have been really talking to rheumatologists about their scores. And that's why we're seeing, you really have to dissociate the lung findings from the skin findings and go after the lung findings because that's where the money is. The skin, you're not going to change. Th those are my two thoughts. George, let me challenge you a little bit on using the steroids. So in a, in a black patient like that, I mean, are you not worried about the dimpling and the hypopigmentation? I mean, you put that in somebody's face every month or whatever like this in the ear, I mean, it's going to cause these changes. Are you worried about that? 
Well, you know, I've been injecting you know, interlesional steroids for 30 years and everything from pimples all the way through. And you, you take a woman from Beverly Hills with a pimple in her face and inject a steroid in her face. You gotta know what you're doing. So the, ca the caveat is you inject superficially, you only put a couple drops in, and you use a one cc syringe so you can really titrate the amount of drug you put into the skin. So I use a one cc Lorlock syringe and I start with 2.5 milligram per cc. Where I've seen dents and, and literally fat atrophy are people who take a three cc syringe, right. squirt about a cc in and end up with a dent. And so it all has to do with technique. And I think somebody should publish a video on how to inject discoid lesion lupus. You'd be a lot uh, more dermatologist, you George. You'd be, you know, should be uh, worried about what you wish for there. But, but you're absolutely right. And my, my question, though, is what gauge needle are you using to inject that? Yeah, I use a 30-gauge needle. 30, wow. Yeah, I use a 30-gauge needle. I draw it up with an 18-gauge syringe and a 2.5 milligrams, really where I start. And uh, because you're less likely to dent someone than people are using 10 milligrams per cc of Kenalog and injecting with a 3 cc syringe. Um, I've seen a lot of mistakes that way. So again, one cc syringe, use a 30 gauge needle, and you literally put a couple drops spaced around, and then you follow them back up and see if you turn off the inflammatory process. As far as depigmentation, um, that's the process itself, destroying melanocytes. Right. And I'm less worried about the steroid, but I am happy that the steroid will turn off that inflammatory process, much the way sort of it does in vitiligo. Time for a couple more. What should we do, Artie? Should we wrap it up here? You got to, well, do you want to do the criteria? Because you got a bunch of questions. So, a um, bunch of questions coming. To the, audience, the, the reality so. is, thank you. The reality is for the, for the next few slides, it's just um, whether or not we're you're looking at the old 1997 updated 1982 revised criteria, the 11 you needed for, or the, the slick classification. This is really for entry into clinical trials, validation of the new ULAR ACR SLA classification criteria a little better sensitivity and specificity uh, than the prior criteria. But when you're looking at, again, the criteria, this criteria versus the slick SLE classific uh, classification criteria, it really wasn't that much better than the old criteria, the 11, using the four, and it's much easier to, to uh, really try to make that diagnosis. This was one study looking at um, uh, the predictors of persistent disease activity and long quiescence in lupus from the Hopkins lu uh, lupus uh, cohort. You can see um, in, your, in your handout what this is about. I think uh, this last two, lul uh, lulizizumab, was not particularly effective in the treatment of lupus, uh, looking at the co-stimulatory molecule CD8. And lastly was the efficacy and safety of baricitinib in a 24-week um, uh, lupus study phase two double-blind randomized controlled study that actually did have efficacy at the uh, appropriate four milligram dose. 